Bruno Walter is one of the outstanding conductors of our age. As he outlines the requirements of a symphony conductor, we cannot escape the feeling that here is a man who exemplifies those qualities of warmth and sincerity of which he speaks. Last summer, the Vancouver International Festival was fortunate in obtaining Dr. Walter's services for its opening concert. Our film records his first rehearsal with the festival orchestra of Brahms' Second Symphony, a behind-the-scenes profile of the artist at work. Now we start with Brahms. Brahms, where are the horns? First horn, first one, two, three, four. Oh. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Trumpets. First trumpet. Uh -huh. First trombone. <laughs> so let's begin. Celli and bass. We begin espressivo. And then diminuendo. And then again. And then again diminuendo. You understand? So always beginning the theme espressivo and go down. <coughs> Sing. Sing, sing. Come down to the point and finish at the point, you know. Then I have my diminuendo and it's a small sando the end. More singing violas. Let's have the whole thing once more. Uh, Woodwinds very piano, but far too loud. So begin once more. <laughs> Down bow. Well, let me hear more of the pizzicato. Go on. Subito. I'm not quite happy still. When we begin to let the A live, you understand? Think it this way. And the flute just the same. There's a letter. A. a. Give me letter A. Flute. Thank you. 
Now I tell you something. All these figures in first and second violin is espressivo. Why? Because you have the end at the end a diminuendo. Otherwise you cannot make a diminuendo. You understand? You are tardi, 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 tardi. Always with espressivo, and at the end it's a diminuendo. I begin from the, the very beginning once more, just to get acquainted with each other. Begin. Begin singing. Yes. Yes. Each time. We have this. It's letter B. Come. Sing out. First time I read it was. I have a special request in the oboes when you have this staccato, you know, this not too staccato, not this, not so extreme, but otherwise it gets very hard, you know. Four before six. go on where I stopped. Oh, 
Pita, Pita, Tim. Lines. Ist die Letter hier? I. Letter I? Yeah. Trumpets. So far we had not yet a real forte. If there, I know there is forte in. Keep it down, you know. The great forte is come later, not so far. Uh, letter? I. Letter I. Your real first real forte. Yeah. Let, later have the same thing. Rap, pa, 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 and forte trom trombones. Now, I begin once more from the very beginning. From the very beginning. I tell you that in uh, flute, when the, uh, in the beginning, wait a minute. Not too much. The whole thing is a little too loud still. I begin once more. Down bow and espressivo. Piano. Very good, Holmes. Very good. I wait for your diminuendo. disappear. Very good. Just at exactly so.
And you accompany CSC. By the way, this uh, phrase, rum pa pa pam pa tam on the frog. Don't play ra ta ta ti ta 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 but rum pa pa pam pa pa pam pa. You know what I mean? Where is it? Rum pa rim pa rum pa rim pa rum pa rum. That's after E. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten bar. Ten after E. This ra ti ta ti ta ti. Yes, yes, yes. Rum pa rum pa rum. All right. Ten after E. Come. Is da 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 a bit before. Do the whole thing on this part of the book. You understand? Begin here and then the whole on the upper part. All right. The last part of the word is. Too loud. Viola, bass. Understand? Shelly and bass, rum, bum, bum, bum. And we, gee, ba, ba, long strokes. This is the difference. Later on, it changes, and we have rum, bum, bim, bum. I would like to do once more the same with the violas and flute come in. You know? Piano, piano, piano. It was the same way I began with the a beat. You know that? Just the last time? Where was it? F. F with a beat. Yes, but perhaps we try once more now uh, a little more piano still. The whole thing in flute. May I have the same thing? F with a beat. Bass, bass. Yes, all right. Oh. Yes, the last bar.
second violins. This. Dr. Walter was originally from Germany, but now makes his home in Beverly Hills. He is retired and lives a quiet life in California. Here we see him in his garden being interviewed by his personal friend, Mr. Albert Goldberg, who is music critic for the Los Angeles Times. Dr. Walter, you have a lovely place here in Beverly Hills. How long have you lived here? I live here since 13 years now. I came to California first time in 1927. I had to conduct a concert in the Hollywood Bowl and I fell in love with it at first sight. So I wished always since then to make my domicile here, but only in 1945 I could do so. Now it is 13 years that I live here and I have not yet regretted it. So after many years in New York with its Allegro Furioso, <laughs> uh, it was a really ne a necessity for me to have this change. Now I am enjoying the Allegretto Grazioso of Beverly Hills and uh, I, it gives me the possibility of taking a new contact with myself, of thinking, of meditating and what's much more important for me, to learn. You recently announced that you were giving up conducting but fortunately you still do a little now and then. Do you plan to continue in this way? Well, after 64 years of conducting it was time to make a break, but uh, I tell you, this is, does not mean a definite and absolute break. If such an invitation like, from Van like this one from Vancouver is coming, I return gladly to my old love and take the baton up again. But generally, I have decided to begin a, a life of tranquility. 64 years is a long time, Maestro. When where did you start conducting? I started conducting in 1894, so 64 years ago. I started uh, in Cologne, in the Opera House of Cologne, with my first opera, and uh, in the fall of the same year, I went to Hamburg. The Opera House had one great leader, that was Gustav Mahler. And in 1900, the Berlin Royal Opera engaged me as a conductor. And there we were three conductors whose name will not be quite unknown to you. One was Richard Strauss, one was Karl Muck, and the third one, this humble and very useful self. Dr. Waller, in view of your long experience in conducting, maybe you'd like to say something about the art of conducting. This is a very complex question, and I'm sorry I, to say I must answer it with a very complex uh, uh, reply. I must distinguish between the purely musical gifts of a conductor, his uh, general human spiritual uh, qualities, and even his moral standards. Now to speak about the first, there are two careers open for the conductor and some of us have made both. The operatic conductor, and the uh, symphony conductor. Now you can imagine what alone the operatic conductor has to strive for. There is the wide, wide field of operas and he must be at home in all this literature. There is the not less wide field of the symphonic literature and he must be at home in this just same, just the same. And finally, he must have the, what shall I say, the personal quality to live up to these very complicated and very uh, strenuous 
uh, demands on his talent and on his character. And there's one point I want to make which very rarely is considered by people who otherwise are at home in the, in the world of music. The difference between the, stu this uh, time of the stu studying for the conductor and for the instrumentalists, the violin player or the cellist or the uh, pianist. These three instrumentalists have their whole boyhood and uh, their whole uh, adolescence to study their instrument, on their instrument, to perfect themselves in its technique. But the poor conductor, he cannot do the same. His instrument is this dragon with 80 heads or 100 heads, and how should he practice on this instrument, which is the first time at his disposal when he begins his career. So he comes out as a naive and uh, beginner and this is a disadvantage which he can make up for only in years of practice. So the pianist, after having uh, made his preparations, he comes out before the public, he knows his technique, he knows his instrument, and he can play. The poor conductor perhaps is the first time he has the baton in his hand. He has no possibility to rehearse, to tell his musicians what he wants, because I tell you from my own experience. He comes out for his first orchestra rehearsal and he has a very clear uh, idea in his head how it should sound, but it is absolutely not what he expected. He is surrounded by musicians and there's a great confusion of sound before his ears and he doesn't know where to begin with his corrections and his admonitions to his musicians. This is one of the very great drawbacks in his uh, activity and it takes a long time and he gets over it. How does a conductor obtain the results he wants from his musicians? This is the great question for all of us. You know, there is the, the, one of the main questions is how to handle persons, how to handle men, how to influence his musicians by word or by his gesture or by his looks. And this was, is something here, his human qualities have very much to say in this question. If he is a man of warm heart and of sincerity, the musicians, even those who are far superior with regard to routine, will listen to him and will uh, accept what he says if he feels sincerity. There, the moral qualities of this man are very much uh, uh, decisive for if he can get them. But you see how manifold uh, are, his, uh, the, are the demands made on him and how versatile he has to be in order to fulfill these demands. So the musical requirements are only part of the... Only a very picture. small part, permit me to say. If he is not a man who loves nature, if he does not know and love the meadows and the brook, he never could conduct Beethoven's pastoral symphony. And if he has not the passion, he has, is not able of ecstasy, he never could conduct Tristan and Isolde of Wagner. Or, uh, or for instance, if he has not a romantic strain in his uh, spiritual makeup, then he could not conduct the Rhenish Symphony of Schumann. So you see what really the personality, the spiritual qualities of the conductor mean for his career and for the quality of his achievements. Meister, you've conducted all kinds of music, new and old, in your career. Now, when you look back, which composers mean the most to you? Which music do you find to be the most durable? Uh, let me go back to my childhood. The first star on my firmament was Beethoven. And I think this is quite understandable, because the youthful mind has a uh, leaning to the powerful, to the uh, titanic, the Promethean, which Beethoven is. For years he was the ideal of my young musician's heart. And at the same time, Schubert, which is a great contrast, of course, but Schubert seemed to me, and seems to me still today, music itself. So it was an elementary, uh, uh, elementary uh, inclination of my heart, which just loved him, loved him and loved his 
thematic substance and so on. And after this came the great event, Wagner and his Tristan, which I heard, I think I was a boy of 13 or so, and he took possession of my soul and changed my life. That is not exaggerated, what I say. Well, then it took some years, and then came uh, Mozart into my life. Mozart came late. Mozart came late, later than the others, because you have to have maturity to understand beauty. Yes. Uh, Goethe said once, the tragic was, n did not play too great a part in his life, but beauty always moved him to tears. And I understand it very well. And so Mozart, which is beauty itself, with this aim, at the same time a uh, measured kind, a measured art of, of expression, all this appealed very much to me when I had my first step of after the adolescence into a mature age. And then you very well can imagine what it meant to me to meet Gustav Mahler in, uh, when I came to Hamburg. And he made me acquainted, playing for me his symphonies. At this time, when I came to Hamburg, 1894, there were two symphonies there, the first and the second. And I must say, these are experiences in my life, which still to this very day, are overwhelming for me. I only very short time ago I recorded the uh, second symphony of Mahler. Last year I performed it in New York and then I fell ill, I could not finish the record, so I finished it now and it came out very well. And I, when I heard the record, I felt again this overwhelming power of Mahler's music, his personality, the spirituality of his being. Now, then I to, to speak of other composers. I loved Berlioz when I was a young, very young man. His boldness and the extreme to which he is always I inclined, his crossing boundaries of music, this all made a great impression on me. And let me see who still made this great. Of course, what I about love Bruckner, my Oh, sure. Bruckner. This is a very special event in my life. I always performed Bruckner, but I always had the feeling of being strange to his form, strange to the extremes of his expression. And one day, uh, one fine day, I fell ill. It, I got a pneumonia, and I was laid up for weeks. And you know, if you have a very serious kind of illness, then you make very great progress. So it is a good uh, recipe for uh, human development. And when after I could leave the bed and regained my health, I had Bruckner. Yeah, I was, had won the maturity now to understand him and his solemnity and his religious greatness, his nearness to all that is uh, lofty and sublime, I had the, the won an understanding and have not yet lost it so far. You used to conduct uh, lots of contemporary music when you were younger. What is your relation now to contemporary music? Let me say it is a friendly one. I, I do my best to understand it, and wherever I feel talent, sincerity, and a musical inspiration, I am only very happy to acknowledge it and to perform it also. There are only two exceptions to which I must confess. I am very hostile to everything that's artificial. And this is, in my mind, a tonality and a 12-tone system. And let me just say this about a tonality. If you want to speak correctly, then you must speak in a grammatical way. You must use your words as the laws of grammar uh, tell you. You have this to do the same thing in music to obey the laws which are imminent in music. Only the difference is that you cannot say in words why this is an imminent law in music and why is this a grammatical law in yeah. language. You can prove the, uh, the grammatical law. You cannot prove the imminent law of music. But we musicians feel them. And this feeling is in the, from boyhood on absolute, you can't deceive it. There it is. And for my feeling, the uh, laws, the immanent laws of music are not observed 
in the, eton, in the etonality. In difference, in contrast to the twelve-tone system, where there is an over quantity of uh, laws, but very artificial ones. And this is such a... Um, uh, Mechanical. Uh, yes, it, 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 yes, it is a compulsory kind of uh, theory, yeah. which I cannot acknowledge. So, you must excuse me, there are my limits. What about jazz? What is your feeling oh, don't about provoke, jazz? Oh, don't provoke me too much. <laughs> oh, we will provoke you. We'd be interested to hear. If you want to provoke me, then I, I don't... Uh, uh, I, I feel like I must answer. And I say that jazz is an insult to me. It is, is I feel debased by listening to it. The uh, use of... The, the monotony of the use of percussion, the shrieking uninterrupted shrieking of the muted brass is nearly unbearable to me and I feel that the popularity of jazz gives a very distressing look into the uh, civilization of our time. Uh, let me perhaps add that I feel that the uh, position of jazz in our music uh, resembles in some way the, the position of the caricature and the, uh, 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 what you call it, the um, cartoon. Yes. Cartoon in, uh, in the plastic arts, in the graphic arts. There are very great talents for the cartoon and the caricature, but you would never con compare it with real great uh, art in painting or in uh, designing and so on. So I only can say that jazz is a danger because it appeals to the lower instincts of the listener and this is characteristic for some uh, tendency in our time which I only can regret. I gather from your remarks about jazz that you ascribe a certain moral force to music. I do, certainly. I even wrote about it. Uh, I think it was an uh, essay which I wrote in, uh, in the thirties in, when I was in Vienna the contents of which are now uh, taken up in my new book on uh, music and uh, musical interpretation. I am so sure of the moral quality in music because my whole life has taught it to me. Let me tell you, first of all, you are so very often in concerts and can look at the faces around you I am sure you will have already observed that the expression of the faces change when music begins. The everyday expression goes away and there's a kind of concentration not only but of uplift in yeah. it when the music begins. Right. Now there is, it is the real uh, proof for the high and lofty quality in music itself as an element lies in the fact that religious works, St. Matthew Passion, the Miso Solemnis of Beethoven, or similar works, the Messiah of Handel, nobody will ever be astonished that they have been composed, because everybody must feel this fits together, the religious content of the words and the religious content of the music. Music brings to mankind a very solemn and lofty message and this perhaps explains, may explain, the worldwide love for music. It is not because people like entertainment. We have so much entertainment, it pours on us from radio and from all sources, yeah. imaginable and not imaginable. But we don't want to be taken as in entertainers. I, by the way, I must tell you that I am always offended to see in newspapers when we conduct, when we sing, entertainment. We are no entertainers. And as other papers bring it into the category of amusements, which is still worse. So you know that we are no entertainers and no amusers, but we have a very high uh, message to bring. I only have to speak about these works, which I mentioned before. St. Matthew Passion, or Brahms, the German Requiem, to know that this does belong into quite another category. And this is only to be explained because 
music has a moral force of its own and so it we must consider it a blessing among the very distressing uh, ex uh, events in our lives. Dr. Waller, I know that uh, in your life you have seen a, an enormous growth in the appreciation and dissemination of music. Would you say that recordings have played a large part in this? I certainly would say so. The recording has made musical history. First of all, to speak as egoist, I am, have now the feeling I have not to go down with my rec records I have made, but something of me will remain after I have gone. So this is the, uh, we have our little place on the side of the great composers because our performances are now preserved and live on. And I must say the uh, uh, record itself, the quality of the record has won enormously. It is nearly so natural now that you could imagine, could nearly imagine you are sitting in the hall where the music is made, but only nearly. So the record uh, cannot perfectly uh, replace the uh, actual music making. But the uh, merits of the record is in so far enormous as it really brings the best, greatest, most important works to the far off ends of the world and they can take part in the most selected kind of making music. The greatest artists, be it singers or instrumentalists or conductors, orchestras, they are now also belong also to the people who live in far places. And this is an enormous, uh, what shall I say, uh, it spreads the message of music in music. Looking back at your long career in music, would you have any general observations to make what it is all meant to you? I have such an observation to make. I want to say, looking back, that my life has been very, very, very rich one. I had to go through trouble, I had to go through, through some ordeal, but I had also much, happen, much happiness, I en much enjoyment in a very high sense of it. And I had all my life through, from my childhood on, the blessing of music. So looking back on my life, I can feel only a, a fullness of gratitude to the higher powers. Mezzo forte. And the next time, just the same thing. I put, shall I put it in, you know? But you will understand me now. Uh, trumpets? Not so much. We have our fortissimi coming later. All this, take a little easier. Also trombone, not too much. All this in timpani, a little um, uh, moderato in, in power. Only here. Ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba -bum. It's the response to that. I begin once more.
far. Do you understand what I mean? From up is uh, up, rump, bye, and now up, the yummy, bye. All right. Letter I. Let us see. Let us see. Uh, the uh, viola is the same thing, you see. Very staccato. Is the letter here? E. All right, letter E. Yes. You understand? I like a joke. Uh, the last letter. Let me have a flute and clarinet. Letter D. D. Letter G. Letter G. All right, letter G.
tempo c'è di peso Piano. Rum. Now, ta da 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 as I have to hear, you understand? Yeah, where's the last letter? Just where we were. O. o? Letter O. Letter O. Letter O. Crescendo! This has to go through. Very, very powerful. Now you have the end, uh, the end of this movement. Don't play the da pa pa. Just to take, take your breath instead. Do you know what I'm speaking of? The C pa pa pa. Don't play that. Take a new breath, then you have more power for the end. You see? All right. Let me have the same thing. Pa 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 ra ra dee. 